good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, you know, hopefully, at some point in the future, we'll be able to get back uh, to seeing each other face to face. But in the meantime, you know, thank you to Richard and the team for for putting together RealX and getting us to some degree to uh, to, to be able to talk to each other. So uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be able to talk to you today. And and, and as Richard says, I'm I'm really going to talk to you um, about you know, the global capital flows around the world uh, in terms of commercial real estate activity. Uh, we're going to touch on pre-COVID a little bit. Um, we're going to really sort of major on 2020 and what happened during the the, the, you know, the major part of the, uh, the pandemic. And of course, we're still in the pandemic. Um, we may not have expected to be here, uh, you know, nine to 10 months ago, but we are where we are. Um, and as we look forward into 2021 and, and hopefully start to see light at the end of the tunnel, I'll talk a little bit about what we might be able to expect uh, this year. Um, so on to my first slide. Um, which is really looking at sort of setting the scene at a very high level. Um, we're looking at the Americas, EMEA and Asia Pac here. We're looking at commercial property transactions. Those are, those are transactions that are valued 10 million or more around the world. And what we've done here on this chart is put on three lines effectively. We've put on uh, 2018 in the light blue, we've put on the dark blue for 2019 and the orange is 2020. So. Um, if I just you know, move forward a little bit and look at what was happening in the Americas um, at the beginning of last year, um, what we really sort of saw, if we were sat here at this time last year, we'd be feeling pretty good about ourselves. We were recording a record year for the US, um, you know, volumes trending above 2018-19 themselves are record years. Um, but then you can see how very quickly, uh, particularly in the US, particularly in the Americas, uh, that the economic lockdowns had an impact on transaction activity. Um, it's actually a faster impact than we saw in Europe and Asia. And that's partly to do with the pipeline and speed of deals in the US. There is, you know, deals happen faster and there's less of a pipeline. So once that pipeline dries up, the deals start to fall away uh, and the volumes start to fall away very quickly. Uh, in Europe and Asia, deals take longer. So the pipeline is a little bit longer. Um, so. You know, what we can see there is that, you know, 2020 was, you know, suddenly turned into a, you know, the, one of the worst years we've had on record, uh, certainly the worst year uh, post GFC. Um, but the positive side for the Americas, and I'll just highlight that with that, uh, the second arrow there pointing up towards December, is that the month of December last year was recorded the highest level activity in the United States we've ever recorded. And that's over a 20 year history. So the month of December um, was a was a record year. Um, Although that hasn't necessarily fed into uh, to January, there's some reasons for that, and, and maybe on the, the panel following this presentation, um, you know, my, my, you know, we can touch on uh, why the U.S. experienced that surge in December, and maybe why it hasn't flown into uh, into January as well. But um, uh, I won't I won't major on that point necessarily in this presentation. But certainly, as we, if we move across the chart and look at Europe, you can see how Europe. Um, actually held on a little bit longer to the summer. Uh, those volumes were sort of, you know, started off the year again, tracking above uh, previous record years, um, but then it started to sort of slow down from the summer onwards. And there were a few things that held it up a, lot, a little bit longer. There were a couple of big portfolio deals, two that closed in Germany, one that closed in the UK, uh, which helped those volumes stay up longer. And that, as I mentioned, that pipeline and the time to do deals meant the deals were already in the pipeline were still getting completed into, into the early months of the summer. Then then it started to sort of falter and we started to see those volumes slide away. Um, Asia um, on the far right there of the chart uh, never really got going. Um, volumes you know, were down pretty much 30% throughout the entire year. Um, if we look at how all of these regions ended the year in terms of 2020 compared to 2019, you know, the Americas was down 33%. Um, you know, Partly, uh, partly flattering in the sense that it had been down a lot more during the year, but that December month in particular helped pick up those, that, that activity. Um, in Europe, uh, volumes were down 26% by the end of the year. Again, we had a little bit of surge um, towards the end of the year in those last few uh, months, of the, months of the fourth quarter. And then Asia ended, uh, actually end, ended down the best, uh, if that's, if that's a, not, a, not a strange thing to say, in that it, it ended down 23% on the year, partly because we did start to see some recovery in activity um, in, in South Korea, in Australia, um, in, in, a, in a few markets where we started to see a, a bit of recovery in activity. Um, 
So that's kind of where we where we are at a at a, at a, at a very global level. Um, if I just sort of uh, oh sorry I, I forgot about it. I'd, I'd added on um, some early indications for for 2021. Um, what you can see here along the bottom is just a, that little black line I've added in there. I just give you some very early indication of um, activity in the market um, uh, in the first few months of the year. You can see that we're tre we're largely trending sort of below. Uh, those previous year's levels, and it's probably you know obviously you know the the momentum um, from 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 last year is not 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 that strong, and, and people still have to start building their their deal pipelines again to get them uh, to get start seeing some volume activity, and we could talk a little bit more about uh, later about what needs to happen in, to, in terms to get those uh, those volumes moving. Um, I would say these are very early indications. You know, data is you know data particularly in Europe and Asia is you know tends to move a little bit on a quarterly uh, cycle, so we've not necessarily got all of our feed of information in for uh, Europe and Asia. So those numbers will probably uh, probably move upwards um, as we start to confirm confirm that information for the first quarter. Um, what I'm showing here is I'm actually going up another level and just going at the global level. But I, I just wanted to sort of highlight um, you know, how, how weak um, 2020 was. Um, you can see that across the world we had uh, you know, in the fourth quarter, and I'll, I'll just highlight on this chart all the individual, all the fourth quarter numbers. And uh, this is a quarterly, this is a quarterly chart. Um, I'll just highlight those fourth quarter numbers. Um, and what you can see here is that, you know, it, it, although the fourth quarter actually did spike, um, as it usually does, you know, fourth quarter around the world is usually the, the highest quarter of the year. Um, it's certainly not at sort of, um, you know, it, it, you have to go back to 2013 to see a, see a comparable uh, level of activity. Um, but it didn't, you know, the, the positive from this chart is that despite the, you know, the severe, unprecedented economic lockdowns we had around the world, we didn't get to GFC level of activity. We still had people doing deals. There was still capital uh, to invest. Um, we weren't, we're not talking about a liquidity crunch um, in the sense that we were um, post GFC. I'll just move on to talk a little bit about, you know, get a bit more, bit more detailed um, and talk about some of the, um, some of the headline um, you know, sectors around the world, uh, some of the headlines, um, you know, as I say on the, the, the text on the right hand side there, it's very much, you know, it was very much about sheds, beds and meds. It's not a, not a phrase um, um, uh, created by RCA, certainly we certainly we picked up, um, picked up, but it's a great sort of, a, it's a great shorthand for, for what it was that was driving people, um, driving investor allocations in, in 2020. Um, you know, sheds is obvious. Sheds is is, is the logistics sector, um, and I think there's obvious reasons why the logistics sector picked up in in 2020. That you know we we've, we've got um, a whole host of things going on. We've got you know the, the long term move to online shopping being accelerated. We've got grocery retailers having to move from just in time to just in case, so they're requiring a lot more storage um, um, for their for goods. Um, so a whole host of things that were were driving uh, the demand for sheds. Um, the demand for logistics. Um, <clears throat> meds is a, is a combination really of medical office and, and life sciences. Um, you know, everyone, you know, medical office has been long sort of sought after as a, as a, as a, as a solid asset in the US. It's, it's expanded around the world. Um, but life sciences has obviously been added to that last year. You know, I mentioned in the text again at the bottom there, we've been receiving a lot of requests from our clients about accessing our life science data and you know, who's investing in life sciences, where are those life science centers? Um, and also, you know, the bed sector. And I would say, you know, we, 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 two years ago, we, we could, talk, could, could have talked about beds as including hotels. Now it's very much about the residential long-term uh, beds, so to speak. It's about the residential sector. Um, hotels was the hardest hit of the sectors um, um, last year. And I just highlight a few. You can see industrial there only down 7%. It was the best performing uh, sector last year, uh, just down just at 7% on, on 2019 levels. And 2019 had a number of massive portfolios deals so for 2020 to sort of almost match those levels is actually quite impressive um hotels is the worst sector uh, down 65 percent um i think obviously we you know we can understand why that is and the future of hotels is is, is, a, is a difficult one to predict uh, given nobody's quite sure how business travel will will recover even though leisure travel will probably probably pick up as people want to uh, like, like myself want to get out of our houses um and finally, I just highlight there the apartment sector. Um, so down a little bit, um, but you know, sort of, um, but certainly not. You know, certainly one of the better sectors last year in terms of uh, in terms of um, uh, resilience. Um, I thought, you know, one of the things that sort of you know connects all of these sectors, you know, the, the sheds, beds, and meds, is that they are they are 
um, feeding off a, um, a long-term structural change. Um, they have structural advantages to them. Yeah, you know, their demographic advantages, their change in retail retail habits, change in shopper habits that are driving these. So there's some long-term uh, structural changes that investors are trying to um, you know tie their portfolios into. As I mentioned again, you know, life sciences has been a big one requested. Data centers um, has been a big one. And I've put here the alt residential sector has been one that we've been getting questions on. And I would say alt, you know, particularly in the US, that's things like manufactured housing um, has certainly been a been, been one that um, people have been asking about. Um, we can do a little bit using the RCA data. Obviously, we're tracking um, investment activity around the world. We're linking those up to the individual buyers and sellers. So we can get some sense of what alloc how allocations have changed. Um, I know there are surveys out there that look at the capital side, how investors want to allocate their capital. But let's look at how, how investors have actually deployed their capital, uh, not, not how they wish to, um, wish to deploy it, how they actually have deployed it. This is obviously looking at transactional activity. Um, and what's interesting is in the Americas, how the, the industrial market has you know, uh, over a few years of a, a trend building has finally actually overtaken the office market um, in terms of in terms of being the sort of number two sector in the United States and in the Americas. So you can see there how the office market has, has, has dropped below the levels of the industrial. Whether that's a trend that's going to continue into 2021, 2022 is, is one you know, we'll have to watch closely. Um, but certainly there's, there's a lot of talk about what the future of the office is. Um, in Europe and Asia, Big sort of uh, change to some degree, a, a structural, certainly a long term, a more longer term structural trend in Europe, um, maybe a sort of a blip in, in Asia, um, is the sort of the fact that, um, you know, um, the, 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 the retail industrial sectors have changed over and maybe that is a reflection, reflection of both retailer and consumer changing, changing uh, needs for their, for their real estate and for their estates. Um, so retailers moving uh, to need more industrial and logistics um, and obviously consumers moving to, uh, to, to, to online shopping. So some real sort of interesting changes in, in, in allocation there from, from our investors. And you know, one of the analysis that my, one of my colleagues, Tom, has done and put on our, uh, our Insights blog on our website recently is looking at the top 50 European investors and how they've changed their habits. And the apartment sector is one uh, where we've seen a lot a lot more of the of the you know the, the these these top investors who have not really done much in the apartment sector in the past in Europe have actually started to move into that in a much more whole, holistic wholesale way um, I would also say that you know in terms of capital flows in terms of you know who who are the investors you know the world order as such you know i'd say here is reasonably untouched and shaken um we're still the investment managers are still so the ones who are sitting on most of the capital to invest and the listed sector is still pretty active and the private equity firms um are still there um sovereign wealth and and, and high net worth individuals which have added in together there partly not not necessarily because of the same type of investor but more more to do with the fact that they are they're kind of all they're both looking at um investments as a as a um as a, as a long-term um capital preservation um uh, structure rather than rather than necessarily short-term returns that may be a bit of a generalization but certainly um, i've added those together there uh, it also helps the numbers appear on the chart because they're both in, in, on their own they're a little bit smaller um but i would i would touch on the investment managers and you know they were down 22 percent in terms of activity last year um, listed sectors down 28%, private equity firms down 45%. That's probably, you know, you can probably just, you know, rationalize that in the sense of one's looking at, you know, one on the investment management side is a little bit more skewed towards core um, and quality assets, which have been trading pretty well. And the private equity side is a little bit more skewed uh, towards opportunistic um, value add. So, and those have been difficult, more difficult deals to do uh, in 2020. Um, you know, uh, you know I, I would say, you know, a core building is a little bit easier to underwrite um, from a desk, uh, whereas a value add and opportunistic uh, building probably does need a little bit more, um, you know, time taken, you know, view it and, and, and kick the tires of it. Um, what's interesting though about these about these numbers is that you know if you look at the institutional numbers, I've split these into into whether they were investing domestic or cross border, you know, and the same with the listed sector, um, cross border. Activity in the investment management world was down 25%. Uh, domestic investment was down 19%. So a little bit more strength in the domestic side. And, and I'll come on to talk about why that's important in a minute. Uh, on the listed side, it's similar. Um, Cross-border activity was down 38%. Domestic activity was only down 23%. So again, um, you know, you can see you can see how domestic investment was a little bit easier for these firms. Now the listed sector is, tends to be skewed towards domestic anyway. 
The private equity one is interesting because it's a switch around. You know, cross-border was down 38%, domestic was down 50%. And I think that just highlights how private equity firms, you know, have tended to become more global. They're moving a lot more capital from one from their headquarter country, where you know, whether it's sort of the US, where, wherever it may be, the US or Europe, uh, and they're moving it to other parts of the world. And that's been a bit more of a struggle um, in, in 2020. So, you know, um, uh, but sorry, the cross-border money has been a struggle, but also they do a, l- a lot less on the domestic side. So, you know, while their business is a little bit more skewed towards cross-border, which may begin, as I mentioned earlier, maybe uh, a little bit one of the reasons why they're they're down forty-five percent versus the others who are down less than that. Um, just to highlight um, here, I won't dwell on this too long, but just to highlight how you know, almost our weather map for activity around the world, this is 2020 versus 2019. Um, if you look across the map, you'll see there are some hot spots. those are in the, in the orange. Um, some you might, you might not have expected, you know, India's there, but we've certainly, uh, we've seen an increasing activity um, in, in the Indian market. Um, but certainly if you look in Europe, for example, you can see that Norway and Denmark had a, had a pretty good year. They had a slowing fourth quarter, but certainly in the middle part of the year, they had a real Real strong activity in Q3. They were the best performing uh, uh, markets um, in Europe. A um, little bit of strength in, in some of the other smaller markets as well. Um, but most of the world is is in that bluer colours, uh, which means their act, you know, their activities were down, you know, ten percent or even you know greater than twenty five percent down on on previous year levels. Um, so you can very quickly get a sense of how how this you know the pandemic has has impacted world um, transaction activity. What we can do using this data. You start to look at a little bit of momentum. You know, were, were any of these markets bringing momentum from 2020 Q4 into 2021? Um, so this, this chart on the left-hand side scale uh, compares 2020 to 2019, and on the bottom scale uh, compares uh, Q4 2020 with Q4 2019. Um, so it gives you some sense of whether there's momentum in the fourth quarter that can be brought into 2021. Um, the fact that most markets are in that bottom left quadrant um, is indicative, indicative of that most of these markets dropped on the year and they dropped in the quarter as well. So, you know, not there's not a huge amount of momentum being taken by these by these um, these countries into 2021. A few exceptions to that: South Korea, a market that's done, you know, came through the pandemic very strongly um, and actually has, has seen some really significant um, investment activity, both domestic by domestic investors, but also by international investors looking at those markets. And Canada, you know, had a weak 2020, but actually in the fourth quarter started to see some pickup. So, you know, um, so there's, there's some there's some positives there. You know, there are, there are markets that aren't even appearing on this chart just for scale reasons. You know, Hong Kong has had a terrible two or three years. Um, it's starting now to see prices bottom out and we're starting to see some real strong activity growth. For example, Q4 was 168% above Q4 2019. So some really strong potential there. Um, still largely domestically orientated capital there. Um, why is this important? Um, you know, um, you know, we can start looking at cross-border share as a total of the overall market. It is falling. Um, you know, so you could you could argue that it's trended for you know, particularly on the uh, um, the cross-border between reasons, it's trended down for a few years now as domestic activity has, has taken some more share. But the two lines on this chart, the darker, the, the solid line is the is the cross-border flows between regions. Um, uh, so that's that's m- m- money moving from the Americas to Asia Pac or from Asia Pac to Europe. The dotted line is is money flowing within the regions. That's money moving between the UK and Germany, for instance. Um, you can see both are trending down, which suggests that in 2020 domestic activity was 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 more important, um, and that's why it matters. That's why it matters to understand cross border versus domestic, um, because domestic activity has helped liquidity. Um, so what. You know, uh, actually, this is a chart one of my uh, my, my colleague Tom uh, produced. Um, you'll hear from Tom a little bit later. Is this is just for Europe? I should just say this is uh, most of the charts on this on this in this deck and, and this presentation are about global, but this is just about Europe. This chart because um, I thought it was a neat way of showing how you know as you move across the chart, you're getting a higher level of domestic um, dominance in a market. So if you move to the far right, you'll see Switzerland, you know, almost 90% of activity in Switzerland is, is domestically orientated. Uh, if you go to the far end, the other far end, you see Poland, where, you know, only 10% of activity in Poland is domestic. So, and as you look at the chart, you can see how, you know, the amount of domestic activity in, in 
the, the, the nine months of the year this focuses on basically post uh, post uh, March, you know, when we're into the into the real pandemic uh, economic lockdowns, um, you can see how markets that had a domestic orientation were actually doing better than those that had a an international orientation. So that's why it matters because that impacts liquidity and it impacts pricing. Um, so Poland, Luxembourg, Portugal, Ireland um, are going to have more pressures on prices than somewhere like Switzerland or Norway, for instance. So where is money coming from when his money is moving around the world? You know, most, most of the sources are down compared to 2020. Um, so you can see the chart on the right, the, the bar chart on the right, you'll see that the, the dark blue is 2020 uh, volumes, um, cross-border money. Um, so this is money originating in the United States, for example, or, or by firms that are headquartered in the United States. And the orange is, 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 so, uh, is sorry, and the orange is the previous year, 2019. You see most of the markets are down. Um, some are reasonably resilient. So Singapore is pretty much at its previous uh, levels. Um, the two markets on here that actually stand out in that the UK and China both increase their activity. China was very much sort of following its logistic, uh, you know, investing in kind of the 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 uh, sort of the, the strategic assets of logistics, for instance. Um, the UK is interesting because you know the UK has, is not a major player on the world scale in terms of moving money cross border. Um, UK UK headquartered investors tend to focus on the domestic market. Um, but they have started to increase that um, effectively since 2016. We've seen some increases, and you know you can make your own assumptions about why that is. Um, but certainly, you know, last year was 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 interesting in that the UK, you know, did did put more money to work outside of the UK than it than it than it had done in 2019. So it is still a net, you know, still exporting more than it did in the previous years, which is which is an interesting sort of a um, an interesting sort of a you know a sort of a, 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 a sort of a, a tidbit. Um, on the on the map there, what you can see is that you know you, you probably can't see it very well, but what, certainly what you can see there is the is the top twenty trade routes, uh, so money flowing between one country and another uh, that we've tracked uh, in two thousand and twenty. Um, I will highlight two um, two which are quite interesting, which is um, Germany into Australia, uh, which is up. 350 percent um some really significant investment activity there by a number of players you know allianz uh, and others um and then uk into australia as well so the you know uk money moving moving uh, moving over to australia as well so you know two interesting sort of you know moving money from europe all the way over to to australia um which are which are sort of new uh, effectively new routes at least you know new routes that have that hit the top 20. Uh, the us is still the number one uh, um, exporter of capital or, or manager of cross-border capital, um, and they are they take eight of the top twenty routes um, around the world. I'll just move on um, to talk a little bit about um, you know the markets and, and then liquidity as well. Um, so. You know, these are the markets, um, the top uh, for 25 uh, global metros around the world. You can see they're all down with the exception of Seoul. And I mentioned earlier that Seoul has had a really had a really strong uh, 2020. Um, you can see there that it's up 4% um, in comparison. And I say really strong in a relative way in the you know, relative to the other markets, but uh, you know, it's up four percent on previous years, which itself, I, I, you know, was a was a record, if I recall. You know, it's eighth position in the world, so it's it's jumped into the top ten for the I think probably the first time. Um, you can see there's not a huge change at the top, but the volumes are down. You know, um, London's actually a little bit flattered; it's down twenty percent um, for 2020. But um, there was a particularly big deal towards the start of the year. It's uh, Blackstone's IQ student uh, portfolio with about four billion, um, and that's largely part of that. Or dark orange color there which is global uh, flows of money um, or m money managed by a, a global manager um, you know take that out and actually london london sort of starts to look a lot weaker uh, if you take four billion out of that then 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 obviously london drops down uh, and starts looking quite a bit, a bit weaker but certainly towards the end of the year we certainly you know anecdotally and evidence-based we're starting to see more activity in london and we're also starting to see you know more bids on on assets if we've if I've understood what uh, what our what our clients are telling us um, but liquidity around the world, um, what we do, what we track at RCA, we, we have a capital liquidity score, um, which tracks 155 markets. It's, it's a score made up of six factors. Um, those six factors are, are various different elements of liquidity, and they roll together to create a single score. Um, we've been doing that for quite some time. We can take it back historically, as you can see here. Uh, and what we can look at in this um, in this chart is the, is the markets which are declining, which are neutral, uh, and which are increasing on, on a quarterly basis. Um, we have, um, you know, uh, we have of the hundred of 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 the 155 markets, 126 
um, are, are recording liquidity at levels lower uh, than 12 months earlier. Um, so, you know, obviously liquidity has been hit badly. But and I do want to see, you know, there are some real positives to take away from the latest analysis. Um, yeah, and I've sort of <laughs> put a little green shoots, um, a green shoot sort of a question there is that, you know, what we're seeing is 35 markets actually saw their liquidity increase between Q3 and Q4. So into Q4, we actually started to see quite a number of markets um, actually having some positive sort of uh, change in their liquidity. So that's a positive for the market. Liquidity levels, you know, although down, are still less, the individual scores, the absolute scores are still well above uh, what we what we recorded during the GFC. Um, so, you know, while liquidity is down in, in, a, in an overall sense, it's certainly still holding up um, better uh, than than than, uh, than GFC period. Um, and prices in markets, you know, as we look at all of our pricing metrics that we have, whether it be our commercial property price indices, which track repeat sales, whether it's our you know, our, our cap rate series, whether it's price per, u, per unit series, uh, they're all showing relative resilience. Um, you know, lenders are showing forbearance to, to investors and, and sellers are holding firm at pricing levels. Um, so we're not necessarily seeing any, you know, a huge amount of distress, uh, which therefore means that prices around, around the world are, are typically holding up pretty well in most sectors, obviously hotels and um, and retail might be, you know, obviously as a, a, aside from that. But um, I would say as, a, as another aside is that, you know, Paris has secured its, its position as the world's number one office market during 2020, which is a positive for Europe, certainly a positive for Paris. Um, it overtook both London and Manhattan uh, in order to get that point. And, and, quite, and it's not just one deal, quite a number of big deals were happening in Paris um, through the end of the year and, and into, into early part of 2021 as well. Let me just finish up with a few slides about, you know, thinking about opportunity, thinking about 2021. You know, I guess the question is, you know, will we return to 2019 peak prices, um, you know, high prices that we were seeing at the end of 2019? Or are we moving into sort of like a post GFC type era of, of lots of, you know, sort of, um, you know, a buying frenzy, so to speak, you know, lots of distressed opportunities out, out there. Um, it feels a little bit like more leaning towards the 2019 um, you know, sort of um, um, exit point, you know, because I, you know, it doesn't look like there's a huge amount of distress in the market at the moment. Um, certainly, as I mentioned, you know, lenders are, you know, showing forbearance, so we're not seeing a massive amount being pushed to the market. But there's still a lot of capital out there. You know, capital raising surveys are still very positive. Um, so it means there's a lot of capital trying to get into, into real estate. And when you take out the, uh, the retail sector as, as, a, as, a, as part of the investor's choice and you take out hotels, um, you're left with a, a smaller group of assets, which will see a large amount of capital trying to get into them. So, you know, capital, you know so the supply and demand balance means that pricing will, will at least hold up. Um, if not sort of uh, start to increase over the, over the coming year or so. Um, and the chart on the left-hand side here is a very high level chart. You know, it's, it's very rare that we actually put a chart in <laughs> this sort of level, but it is, it's global industrial, global office and global retail. And just looking at the cap rates that are being recorded for transactions in those. And I think it just tells a, a pretty neat story about where these markets are that, you know, industrial is now going from, you know, from yield levels with, you know, sort of 10 years ago, which were in the sevens. Um, it's trending down for quality logistics assets that led to sort of high quality tenants, you know, are trending down towards kind of average office levels. Um, the retail sector, on the other hand, has been trending upwards for some time and we're starting to see, um, you know, so those, those yields, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, start to obviously on an average basis go into the, into the sixes. So, um, so we, we, you know, retail seems to, you know, as, as, as structural trends would, would dictate are sort of is losing ground, whereas industrial and, and, and office are sort of, um, are, are sort of keeping a, keeping solid there on the pricing levels. The chart on the right is just our, our, the percent of assets that are trading, which are coming from a distressed position. Uh, and you can see that, you know, post GFC, it, it peaked up in, in, in both Europe and the US, um, but at the moment it's running around, you know, less than 2% of, of assets uh, in these markets. Now that may pick up in 2021, but if, I think if you're on the sidelines waiting for a massive amount of distress, you may, you may be disappointed, uh, particularly in the quality, uh, particularly in the sectors which, you know, outside of retail and hotel perhaps. Um, so that's sort of you know my thoughts on where we may end up in, in 2021 in terms of in terms of pricing. And just finally, I would just give you one one example, and it's a very close to home example. And I you know we can we can repeat this throughout the world, but I just wanted to show this you know is where there might be opportunities just based on sort of um, you know sort of changes. You know, 
This is looking at our liquidity scores on the left-hand side, which is our liquidity score for central London office. Um, you can see that you know liquidity, as as we score this, is at its lowest levels um, you know since the GFC um, in in London, as you know particularly you know since um, you know since 2015 post Brexit referendum, um, you know it's been you know it's been a market which has been more difficult for investors to uh, to make a decision on. Um, cap rates are holding up pretty well though. Um, you know, and, and I would say that, you know, if, if you look at it from two sides, the buyer and the seller side, if, as a buyer, the trade off is, you know, we, you could access London at the moment at a time when its liquidity is the lowest we've recorded for a long time. If that liquidity picks up as it probably expected to, and certainly, you know, the green shoots are sh you know, suggesting that it is starting to pick up, then that is likely to put a further downward pressure on yields. So if you're a buyer now, you should potentially see some uh, some positive uh, impact from yield movements in, in over the course of the next year or so, if that liquidity uh, continues to pick up. As a seller though, on the other side, you know, there is a massive amount of capital, a weight of capital wanting to get into London. Um, if the capital raising surveys are to be relieved, uh, yields are holding up and it may be time to sort of start testing that market. So you've kind of got those two sides of the equation. It might mean that you know, the biased seller expectation, the gap between buyer and seller pricing that exists at the moment, particularly in somewhere like central London, uh, starts the, the spread on that starts to narrow uh, pretty quickly in 2021. And we might see London, for example, um, see quite a lot of uh, activity pick up. London is also in yield terms is, is now sort of um, you know, looking better value than, than somewhere like Frankfurt or Paris, uh, which have still seen you know, quite a lot of activity in recent recent years. So, yeah, there's just some thoughts on, you know, obviously we can repeat this for any market around the world, looking at the, the liquidity score and and cap rates Dublin is is a slightly you know uh, is the opposite in this sense that we're seeing the highest liquidity we've ever recorded and the highest highest yield level so that yeah that might you know that might sort of indicate there's a little bit harder to sort of make that make that call on on somewhere like Dublin so thank you very much you know, I'd like to leave you with these these final thoughts um you know from the presentation you know I think what we've seen is some some you know, long-term structural trends, which trends which have really been accelerated uh, during 2020. Uh, you know, some new sectors have risen risen up the shopping list. We've seen you know life sciences and and uh, data centers and and uh, you know, senior housing become more more important uh, to investors. But also niche sec sectors within sectors. You know, cold storage, for example, in the logistics category has suddenly become one where we're getting a lot of questions from our clients about the data and pricing for those assets around the world. So certainly there seems to be some niches and some uh, specializations that people are, are looking at. Um, you know, early in the pandemic, as I mentioned, you know, domestically orientated markets had held up better. That does seem to start to wind and winded uh, and wound uh, towards the end of the year as, as investors uh, started to, to adjust to new models of activity. They've been able to sort of understand how they can use, you know, online technologies, sort of, um, you know, have local uh, local players uh, go in with, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of recording viewings of, of properties, etc. And, and and certainly some investors who have clearly got already got international platforms in place with people on the ground are certainly able to benefit from 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 those those investments they've made over time so we have started to see that that benefit from being domestically orientated starts starts to unwind towards the end of the year um so we, it's questionable whether that, that will will hold true in 2021 um you know, overall liquidity has been hit, um, but pricing has held up. Um, quality assets coming to the market do seem to be outperforming some seller expectations. I mentioned that seller expectation gap um, is, is likely to close quickly in certain markets. Um, um, and capital is plentiful. If you if you look at the investment capital raising surveys, um, you know which which are plentiful. Um, you know, they all seem to be saying the same thing that investors still want to be in real estate. It still shows well against bonds um, and other equivalents. Um, you know, it's just the opportunities are not as plentiful as the capital. So what that suggests, unless there is a surge of distress, unless I'm wrong on that point, um, then there's likely to be sort of um, a lot of a lot of capital. Uh, chasing after a reasonably small set of so that may put pressure on pricing, and it, I say it may also bring that seller buyer price expectation gap down a little a little quicker than uh, we might have expected. Um, so with that, Richard, um, I may thank you and, um, and 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 leave it to the panel to pick up some of these points.